Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, we will be starting in just a minute, and I will be turning it over to my colleagues, Lindsay Corcoran and Paula Knowlton. We'll just wait a few minutes for everyone to join. All right, so I believe that we are at the top of the hour. So welcome everyone. Um, I know we have a few people just joining now. Um, thank you for joining us for the call conference. Um, we will be going over the critical, uh, financial and operational virtual conference um, starting with Lindsay Corcoran and Paula Knowlton today. Um, so I will turn it over to Lindsay and Paula. Great. Thanks, Dahlia. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, today's uh, day two of Region B Critical Access Hospitals Financial and Operational Virtual Conference. Um, we're happy that you're here. We can go to the next slide. Just a few housekeeping um, items to go over. Everyone's going to be muted for today. Um, if you would like to ask a question, we like you to use the chat function or the Q&A function. You can find those right down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, both the slides and the recording will be made available to all uh, folks that registered following the web webinar. Uh, the sessions will be recorded. And then also after today's webinar, there will be a brief survey. Um, and if you could uh, fill that out, that would be great. Um, your feedback is certainly important for us as we continue to um, improve upon our sessions and offer you uh, the highest value that we can. Next slide, Paula. A little bit about Stroudwater. Uh, we are a uh, nationally recognized rural healthcare uh, consulting healthcare consulting firm. We offer a wide range of healthcare related services. If you're not familiar, um, and we do these, you know, just kind of our locations um, of our clients since 2017. Next slide. Um, we also have a uh, financing arm within Stroudwater uh, called Stroudwater Capital Partners, um, and they can help you with all of your financing needs, um, you know, facility financing, uh, any type of capital purchases, uh, they can help you uh, do that. And then lastly, again, just a brief overview of who we are. Um, really, you know, our, our mission for uh, us as a consulting firm really is, is to provide folks um, working with rural hospitals, community hospitals, healthcare systems, and, and physician groups across the country is, is really to provide those strategic and operational uh, mission-driven advisory services. And uh, we, again, you can see the list of our services here on the screen. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Paula, uh, and she is going to kick things off with you all. Um, but today we're talking about uh, swing bed quality outcomes, and we're going to go over some uh, really uh, great data that we've been collecting um, and just do a three-year review. So, Paula. Thanks, Lindsay, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about the background of the swing bed quality reporting program that we've built just for critical access hospitals. We'll talk about the three-year quality outcomes. Um, findings from the field, the, the improvement stories. We have some case studies that we want to share with you, and then how to leverage your swing bed quality data. So we're going to start with the background. So Stroudwater worked with the University of Minnesota's research team and the Flex monitoring team back in 2018. Uh, we um, built this tool for critical access hospitals to track their swing bed quality metrics. Um, we used CMSs. Um, section, uh, the MDS, the minimum data set, section GG, for building the um, functional assessments. And then we also collect the um, risk-adjusted data elements so that we can risk-adjust those scores so you can not only compare yourselves to other critical access hospitals, but you can go and compare yourself to those larger counterparts as well on the quality metrics. We worked with 114 critical access hospitals across 14 states for our pilot project 
um, from 2018 through 2019. Um, I have some results of a study that we completed um, to share with you as well. Um, critical access hospitals really liked the program. They had a lot of benefits from it, asked us to continue this program after the pilot project, which we did. We made quite a few enhancements throughout the years. Um, and as of today, we have um, three full calendar years of data that we are going to share with you. Um, so those results so that you can see some of the national benchmarking for the quality metrics. That national study is available. Uh, you can just go to our website and, or click on the link once you receive the slides. But some of the key um, results from that national study really showed that the critical access hospitals had a significantly less or lower risk-adjusted hospital readmission rate from the rural SNFs. The critical access hospitals were 13.6%, while the rural SNFs were at 21.1%. Approximately three quarters of the patients from the critical access hospitals returned to their prior living situation or a more independent level of care. And a substantial average improvement was shown through those functional assessment scores um, by the change in the self-care and mobility. Right now, through to, uh, from 23 to 24, that we are in working with um, clients in 19 states. We have approximately 200 critical access hospitals utilizing our web application. Um, so you really get a good benchmarking across the critical access hospitals. Uh, some of these hospitals are just using the tool individually and, and you know, and really tracking their progress um, from looking at where they are, looking at their month over month trending, putting in those interventions and seeing how their progress is. We also work with several states with cohorts of hospitals, and they're able to network with their peers, talk about best practices, um, and really do some of the action planning and the intervention to make those um, make those uh, performance improvements. The program itself is very simple to use. It, we you know collect a lot of information um, from you, same as what CMS does with the MDS, the certain pieces of it that we built for the critical access hospitals. We give back to you. So you enter your data, you click on a couple of buttons and your reports are right there and available to you. You get a monthly hospital report, which is really that month over month trending. So you're able to track your performance improvement initiatives, see your progress, see if you need to change up some of your interventions to, to, to make those outcomes more positive. You'll get quarterly benchmarking. So you benchmark against all of the critical access hospitals within your state that is usual, utilizing the tool, as well as to a national median of critical access hospitals. And then we also have what we call our performance report, which is really a marketing piece for you. Um, you get to, you know, you let your community know what your swing bed program is all about. And then we use those five key metrics from CMS to, to, to publish your quality scores. This, um, and the, the middle of the screen here is the performance report. That report you can just send off to your referral providers and you they have the information about your swing bed program and your quality scores to provide to those patients looking for post-acute care. Then you're able to bring those patients back but to their own community where they're closer to friends and family um, during their re recruitment period. Those five key metrics, I just wanted to point those out that we really look at these with CMS. We, we help our clients understand um, where they are with these and how to make improvements through best practices. Um, the first one is return to acute care um, from the swing bed. And those are the unplanned returns to acute. So really tracking those and then talking about what if there was anything that could have been done to prevent those returns to acute. Return to acute post 30 day, 30 day discharge. So those folks are being readmitted to the acute care setting or for an ED visit or for an ED visit um, for same or new condition within 30 days after discharge. The risk adjusted performance improvement in mobility. So we risk adjust the scores, putting all of you on the same playing field. So you really get a good comparison. Um, and when we risk adjust, you get a percentage score. And that percentage is the percentage of patients that are meet that are meeting or exceeding an expected performance improvement score 
for mobility. And then measure four is the risk adjusted improvement for self care. And then we have the last one, which is discharge to community. So really looking at your patients and making sure that um, those patients are going back to their community, to their home or to a more independent level of um, living um, and really tracking that in critical access hospitals do much better than the um, rehab and larger SNF facilities in that particular measure. Now we'll talk about the three years, um, three year uh, quality outcomes and I'll turn this back over to Lindsay. Great, thanks Paula. And we can go to the next slide. All right, so uh, this is probably what you're all been waiting for is our three year uh, trended results. Um, and the reason why we did three years is because uh, we've been collecting data ever since we've, you know, obviously started and developed the, the uh, quality outcome uh, program, but uh, we started risk adjusting a, back in 2021. Um, and so we wanted to obviously just compare um, and look at those three years of data. Um, so you can see, you know, our unplanned ret return to acute um, has increased, um, uh, you know, not something that we certainly want to see, um, but we have, you know, surveyed uh, some of the critical access hospitals and kind of under tried to understand, you know, why are we seeing over those from 2021 to 2023, why have we seen that increase in our unplanned uh, returns to acute? And uh, some of the critical access hospitals have kind of attributed the increase to some of the limitations within discharge planning um, and the pre-admission process. So how are you getting, you know, screening folks for your swing bed program? Are they the most appropriate uh, patients to be placed into your swing bed program? Uh, and, you know, so some of those uh, have contributed to those unplanned return to acute care. We also um, have seen a decrease in our return to acute care within 30 days. Um, that's, that's a decrease uh, from 2022 to 2023 of 9.6% to 8.7%. And, you know, uh, the critical access hospitals have shared with us that, you know, they have s improved their uh, timely discharge follow-up phone calls. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of, you know, certainly seeing the importance of doing timely discharge follow-up phone calls. We like to see hospitals um, conduct a discharge follow-up phone call within 24 to 72 hours post-discharge, and then again before that 30-day mark um, really will help and uh, contribute to, and to the improvement here within that return to acute care within 30 days. Um, Self-care and mobility improvement, uh, this again is the risk-adjusted. Uh, performance has improved since 2022, um, and we we can contribute that to strong interdisciplinary teams. You know, uh, one of our recommendations and one of the performance improvement interventions that a lot of hospitals have had is, you know, who who needs to be on our interdisciplinary team, and what has um, what's the focus? You know, when do we uh, communicate? How often? How frequently? Do we have special tools that we leverage? to help us all kind of be on that same page, um, helping us kind of plan the care of, of our swing bed patients. Uh, also that improved communication and then improved discharge planning, really driven by that interdisciplinary team uh, has contributed to improvements in both self-care and mobility. Uh, and then lastly, discharge to community, that's um, increased. So we, we, again, in a positive way, positive direction, we want to, you know, the, the point of the swing bed program is to return a patient back to uh, a prior level, some type of a level of functioning. Um, and oftentimes discharging them back home is, is an ideal kind of the gold star, right? If we can do a safe and appropriate discharge to home is, is excellent. Um, and so we've seen an increase since 2021. Uh, critical access hospitals have mentioned uh, that they have improved their discharge planning processes. They involve patients and families in that discharge uh, throughout that patient's stay within the swing bed program and really provided ongoing education throughout the swing bed stay to ensure that that discharge home is safe and appropriate uh, for that swing bed patient. Next slide, Paula. Okay. Um, and what we also were able to do, as Paula mentioned, you know, this is these measures, these key metrics are exactly what skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes that are short term stays 
um, are collecting, you know, leveraging the MDS. And this is also what rural hospitals um, are, you know, 50 beds or less that have a swing bed program are also collecting. Um, and, and so we took this data that we are collecting and have collected with our critical access hospitals and we're able to compare it to skilled nursing home for performance. Um, and we'll talk about how we can leverage this information from more of a competitive standpoint, but really how does the critical access hospital swing bed program stack up to one of a skilled nursing facility? And um, you know, certainly we had the results from the study and now we have some more updated metrics and results um, that we can share with you. So what we've done is we've, uh, to compare the critical access hospital results to the skilled nursing facilities, we compiled the data for the same period as CMS. So there's different data set, data timeframes for each of the different metrics. Um, and, you know, we can see where um, the critical access hospital is performing better or, um, you know, have some opportunities to improve as it relates to the skilled nursing facility score. So again, the five key metrics here, um, you can see that 73.6% uh, of the critical access hospital swing bed patients were discharged to their community, which is significantly exceeding the skilled nursing uh, home rate of about 40, 50, 50%. Um, we have 8% 8 of the uh, critical access hospital swing bed patients experienced unplanned returns to acute compared to a higher rate of the skilled nursing facilities, which was about 11.4%. Um, and then we also have 9.2% of the critical access hospital swing bed patients had a return to acute care within 30 days post-discharge. Uh, this was lower than the skilled nursing facility, which was at 10.5% for that same for the same time period. The uh, two the two metrics again the self care and the mobility uh, risk adjusted performance improvement scores were uh, a bit lower than the skilled nursing facilities when comparing the data. And we've worked closely with uh, many of the critical access hospitals who are kind of performing lower um, in these, these. And what we've done and helped them kind of achieve is working through kind of a performance improvement plans, you know, looking at developing an action plan specifically for that key metric. And what are some of those, um, you know, what is your desired goal? What, what do you hope to achieve? And then helping them with their various interventions um, to hopefully, you know, uh, improve in that score. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of the importance of uh, really working through quality improvement uh, to improve in 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 the scoring here, but also just improve kind of from an organizational wide perspective. And go to the next slide, Paula. All right. So just wanted to share um, how. Uh, since implementing uh, the, the Swing Bed Outcomes uh, Quality Reporting Program, critical access hospitals have uh, shared with us, you know, wh what they've been able to do with it, what they've liked about the Swing Bed Quality Reporting Program. Uh, it's a way for them to really track and trend their Swing Bed data. Uh, there really hasn't been a program out there that's been able to do that. Um, if folks were tracking some type of data, it was very just kind of a manual process uh, and there was nothing that they could uh, benchmark to. Um, where we have the ability, given the uh, number of participating critical access hospitals, that we can start to compare to peer critical access hospitals, state and national averages, and then also other skilled nursing facility data um, as it's pub publicly available. Uh, with, you know, their information and their data, they're able to have opportunities around goal setting and performance improvement. Um, you know, if you are, are looking at that, that you are below a state average, you know, there's an opportunity, right? Um, we can start to develop action plans and improvement plans to uh, see where we need to and what are the interventions to improve um, closer to that state average. Um, we've also, they've shared with us about the improved communication. Um, the leveraging the quality reporting program has allowed for improved communication across all disciplines, whether it's nursing, rehab, uh, case management, again, really all kind of being on that same page and understanding 
uh, the needs and the, the outcomes and the desired outcomes of the patients within the swing bed program. And then lastly, really the ability to share performance uh, reports. You know, like any type of quality metric or scorecard or dashboard that you all have and, and you're able to share with, with leaders, with your uh, board, um, you can now do that, you know, with this quality reporting program. Um, and we have the reports and the tools in which that you can download and to be able to do that. Next slide. All right, just a few um, kind of uh, stories, if you will, um, of how some of the hospitals that we've worked with have uh, done, seen some improvement, um, both from a qualitative and quantitative side. Um, Wayne County Hospital, Critical Access Hospital in Kentucky, uh, really wanted to focus on improvement in the risk-adjusted mobility functional assessment side. Um, some of the qual qualitative results when they really focused on on improving um, from a 14% uh, functional assessment rate to, um, and, and they've actually improved to 16.7%, uh, and then again to 24. So some of their improvement uh, they've they've seen from a qualitative perspective has been through that increased communication. Uh, improvement in communication across all of those disciplines. Um, they al also, um, you know, through that improvement journey, uh, provided lots of education uh, to staff, uh, nursing and rehab staff on coding, um, making sure that it's both accurate and consistent, and, you know, making sure that you are kind of presenting that patient um, in, in the truest form, right, and making sure that our coding and our documentation meets that. Um, and then, you know, also implemented patient care huddles, uh, which again helps improve in terms of the communication and the staff involvement. And then involving family, uh, family and caregiver involvement uh, as it relates to the swing bed program. Um, it really, it can really help with all of the outcomes in the in really achieving some of those desired outcomes. Um, and so again, you can see that they've had some nice improvements since 2022 of about 14 percent and then in 2023 um to all the way up to about 24 percent so nice nice job on that there the next um hospital is at kearney uh county hospital in or health system excuse me in nebraska uh they also wanted to focus on improving their risk adjusted mobility functional assessment um, so they, you know, have has have had a tremendous uh, improvement. Um, back in 2021, they were about at a 15.4 percent in terms of their improvement score, and now uh, in 2022, they've improved it to about 64 percent. Uh, so some of their uh, qualitative results included again increased communication. Uh, so you'll you're seeing a theme, right? There's that leveraging that interdisciplinary team and how, how that has kind of enabled you all to um, improve on communication and that level of kind of transparency and making sure that we're all on the same page. It's kind of a team sport when it comes to, to the Swing Vet program. Education, again, for both nursing staff, patients, families, um, and making sure that they really focus on staying mobile throughout the stay and when at home, um, and then increasing daily activities to heal. Um, and so, you know, what they were doing as a, you know, as part of their activities and uh, rehab program, uh, really promoting that that healing aspect. They also utilized a whiteboard, and I think that also uh, utilization of a whiteboard as a communication tool between the care team and uh, certainly the patient and the family is essential. Um, really outlining what those daily goals are. So really uh, on the, those uh, goal setting and those desired outcomes, all kind of working uh, to, you know, and going in the same direction. Uh, the other thing I love using with a whiteboard is making, is articulating that, that desired or that expected discharge date. Um, and I think that's so important when we're thinking about, you know, how do we get folks home um, and, and really kind of working and, and striving for going home and what that did, that potential discharge date looks like. And then also, you know, discuss discussions between staff, family, patient um, of, of those daily goals, leveraging that that um, whiteboard. 
um, as that communication tool, making sure that they understand uh, that they're they're accountable um, in being active and, and making sure, again, contributing to that improvement in that mobility score. Next slide. All right, and then the last uh, uh, story that we'd want to share with you is from Marshfield um, Medical Center, and this is in Park Falls, uh, Wisconsin. And they um, were, were working on both the improvement score in mobility and also self-care. And you can see, you know, they had in their in terms of their mobility score, they were about at a four, four, 43% improvement. Um, and which was much higher than the national median. So they had a really great uh, performance score in terms of mobility. And in self-care also, they had, a, you know, have done a very nice job in terms of their self-care measure, which uh, compared to the national median is about 48%. Uh, so some of the um, uh, kind of what they've wanted to do is make sure that um, their nursing staff is really part of the team uh, and so, you know, it's not just a rehab focused program. Uh, it's not just, you know, case managers running the show or rehab running the show. Nursing involvement um, is really key to success uh, in the in the swing bed program, making sure that at, that those goals that are set, nursing is a part of it and, and really working towards that improvement in both mobility and self-care. Um, Next slide, Paula. All right. So how so how would you leverage um, the data that is provided that comes out of the swing bed quality reporting program? Um, and so why why swing bed quality? Well, you know, we know as critical access hospitals and likely providing swing bed services. We know that the level and quality of care within the swing bed program is, is excellent. We probably have testimonials and patient stories about how great our services were and how, um, you know, that they've been, the, these patients have returned to a level of functioning that they never thought they, they could achieve, all because of the swing bed program. And, you know, I, there is no swing bed compare. There's like a hospital compare or a nursing home compare. And so our swing bed programs, there is no way that we can show or share the level of quality that is achieved within our swing bed program. So, it, and, and to make matters worse, you know, CMS as part of the conditions of participation um, put out as part of the discharge planning rules that uh, post-acute care providers, uh, you know, hospitals have to provide as part of the discharge planning, a list of post-acute pair providers for a patient to make a choice, right? So patients have a choice on, on where they want to go to receive post-acute care uh, services. And that could include, you know, skilled nursing facilities, home health, inpatient rehab, um, long-term care, you know, and within that list of all these different types of post-acute care services, they all include quality measures. One thing that we have found is that one, swing bed programs are never listed on these uh, post-acute care provider choice letters that are given to patients, you know, maybe at a health system or even at our own hospital. Um, and we have no way of adding quality information to that list if we even make it to the list. So this quality reporting program really allows us, one, to encourage folks to make sure that they're on the list, but then we have some data to back up our actual performance and our outcomes in the high quality of care that we are providing within our swing bed program. So, you know, I encourage you, uh, even if you're not participating in the swing bed quality program, make sure that you are, your swing bed program is on that post-acute care provider choice letter. Um, that's getting sent out to patients. Uh, so that's really why, right? We we know that it, high quality of care and uh, you know excellent outcomes are coming out of the swing bed program, but we really haven't had a mechanism and to be able to to share that information. Next slide. So we want and encourage uh, folks to establish kind of a a quality uh, swing bed quality program. Uh, and it would include kind of swing bed quality goals. Um, and so, you know, if you're thinking about, if you're not, it, you know, part of the swing bed quality reporting program, 
uh, you can still certainly start to think about developing a measurement system. How are we and what are we going to measure as it relates to our swing bed program? I mean, we could track and trend and look at the percent of patients that we discharge back uh, home. Uh, and, you know, so we look at their discharge disposition and we can, we can say that we can track that. Maybe that's what we're going to focus on. Um, and maybe that, that measure is what we also want to improve. So what are some of the ways in which that we want to improve the performance of our swing bit program relative to any measure an established target an established goal? Um, and we're going to apply best practice quality improvement tactics, right? We're going to maybe do a root cause analysis if it's not, if our, um, our performance is not meeting our, our standards or it's not meeting the target in, in which we hope to achieve. Um, and then, you know, some of the additional goals are, you know, okay, great. How are we going to improve and sustain results? You know, what's our long-term strategy? How do we measure success? And lastly, how are we going to market and promote performance? Um, and I think that's really the key too, is yes, we know that we are, we're providing high quality of care. Now we've had some established metrics. Now, now it's a matter of marketing and promoting the performance to referral sources, to the community, to really help, you know, really leverage, um, it, high quality within the swing bed program. Next slide. So what are some kind of quality improvement best practices? Um, and it, for, you know, a spoon bed quality reporting program, uh, certainly it, it starts high level, you know, really having the support, um, of administration, making sure that, you know, uh, leadership is on board and is supportive and understands the swing bed program. Um, and making sure that we also have the input and the buy-in from our quality, um, of our quality program with staff. You know, if we're going to have them be expected to track and trend certain key metrics, they need to have a level of understanding. They need to have buy-in of the quality uh, program as well. Um, we would encourage folks to look at data um, on a monthly basis, making sure that we assess where we are relative to a target, to a benchmark, um, and making sure that you know, we're trending in the right direction. And if we're not trending in the right direction, what is it that we need to um, intervene? Where do we need to kind of do a performance improvement uh, process uh, for improving and, and it's hoping to achieve those desired outcomes? Um, you know, and I always like to say, you know, if you're you're seeing trends go a certain way, start to ask questions, ask questions about your data. Um, you know, maybe you're seeing, you know, wanting to know, is there a correlation between your patients that may have that shorter length of stay and the self-care and mobility scores that you're seeing, or, um, what has been therapies availability and how has that impacted your, uh, self-care and mobility scores? Have we had a, uh, you know, a shortage of nursing staff and what's that impact been on are your census? and uh, the availability of staffing uh, to, to meet some of these goals. And then maybe you have a high percentage of return to acute during a swing bed stay with a very low census. So really kind of working through and asking your data certain questions, questioning your data, making sure that, um, you know, if there are improvement opportunities that that is uh, implemented. And then, uh, you know, as always, work on increasing and growing uh, utilization. Um, you know, certainly a low census can have an impact on scores, but we really want to make sure continue to kind of build build your program, grow your program. Next slide. Oh, I think we're it. <laughs> and then, so really, you know, at, in in conclusion, if you will. Um, you know, the swing bed quality reporting program is really beneficial to critical access hospitals. Uh, not only are you able to kind of track and understand the level of quality and patient outcomes that are achi being achieved within your swing bed program, but it also is a, is a great um, uh, tool to be able to use or a program to be able to use to market your services. Uh, promote to your community, uh, tell the story, not with data and not just maybe a patient testimonial or a feeling that you may have. Um, and so really having that opportunity for some, some data is, is really um, great. 
But if you are not uh, participating in the program, uh, you know, there are ways that you can still look and, you know, look at your own uh, outcome data and quality data related to your swing bed program and use that to really highlight um, your program and make sure you're on that patient choice or provider choice letter as well. With that, um, we thank you. Thank you very much for um, coming to today's uh, day two webinar on our swing bed quality reporting program. Um, and we do have some time for questions. And you can use the Q&A function that's down at the bottom of your screen, or you can drop anything in the chat. We'll just pause for one minute. All right. Well, excellent. So thank you both. Uh, thank you all. Our Paula and I's contact information is here on the screen. Um, and we're going to, um, oh, we did get a question here. Um, oh, is there a standard patient staff ratio for swing bed? Um, there is not a lot of times, um, hospitals will, um, uh, if you are doing, you know, patient to staff ratios, it will be within your, a additional inpatient, uh, your acute, uh, census as well. Um, we have had some hospitals do ratios for just swing bed, but, uh, typically it's kind of built into your acute census. Um, I don't know if there's anybody on the call that wants to share if they do have a separate uh, ratio for swing bed from a staff perspective. Uh, the other thing is just to know is, as you know, you know, your swing bed patients aren't receiving the same level of care that your, uh, from a nursing perspective, that your acute patients are. So you have to kind of, that's why, you know, acuity um, also has to be factored into that. And then, you know, I would also add that a lot of hospitals have expressed even just the level of acuity of their swing bed patients um, has also increased. So having that, making sure that that's factored um, in there as well. Thanks for your question, Linda. Okay, well, with that, um, I think we have our next speaker is on. Um, and going to have Keith Bubbleos joining us. Um, he is going to talk to you all about the congressional district state profiles. So take it away, Keith. Good morning. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, let me just load my uh, screen here. So it's a little bit different um, uh, topic that we're talking about here. Uh, this is going to be a project um, that we did with NOSOR and uh, with um, um, NRHA. Uh, earlier this year, um, and it's a free, uh, you know, publicly available dashboard um, looking at some of the uh, some of the data that uh, that NRJ and NOSOR was was uh, hoping to share. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just share my screen here. Hang on a second. Okay. All right. I want to give you a little bit of background about what the, the project is um, you know, the data that we used. Um, um, how we defined uh, some of the some of the terms, and then and then how you can use this this dashboard. Again, this is a free resource for um, for for everyone um, uh, that's on our website. And uh, so let's get into it. All right. So um, this is a project again with uh, uh, um, NOSOR and NRHA, and it was inspired by um, the uh, uh, CA conference in 2022, or Alan Morgan. Uh, was talking about the power of of grassroots grassroots lobbying for for rural healthcare providers, um, and so the team uh, at, here at Stroudwater we started thinking about you know how could we do to kind of help that cause and help to arm you know board members and policymakers and CFOs and CS CEOs and and and, and people that are there within rural health um, with facts that um, that are specific to that those those rural areas. Um, and we wanted to do it by a congressional district uh, boundary um, to 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 filter it by that. So um, uh, so those um, those providers can can take that information to actually to their 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 congressional uh, offices, state their, their representatives, um, and just let them know what's going on in rural health 
um, and you know how these these different things are are are, are different from from uh, the, the overall um, you know non rural areas of the country. So um, so NRHA and and NOSA are both saw some value in looking at these profiles. Uh, we worked with them uh, later um, late in December, uh, uh, October, November, December of last year um, to kind of you know. Uh, uh, coordinate and, and narrow down what we what focus we wanted to have on this on this dashboard and this data, and what data sources we wanted to use, um, and then we ended up uh, presenting this, um, uh, pre releasing it in February earlier this year at the uh, the policy conference in Washington D.C. Um, and one of the nice things what we were able to do is uh, uh, attendees at the conference once we launched it, they were able to actually go up to visit on Capitol Hill um, to speak with their representatives and their senators and the and the staff members of those those offices and and actually use this tool to kind of show them what uh, what the what rural health care looked like in their in their own district. So um, the profiles they they provide like a, a critical baseline inf of information so the status of of healthcare access you know outcomes. Um, uh, what the workforce is. Um, and again, we wanted to break it down into congressional districts so that advocacy can be done um, to, to members of Congress. Um, but it's also a good resource for, for hospitals just within their area, just to see what's going on. So, um, and again, it's gonna, it, it helps the NRHA, its members, and then NOSOR to tell the story of rural health. So our goal uh, was we based the, the the profiles on the the three pillars that uh, NRHA at the time is focusing on. So infrastructure, um, where the actual facilities where people go, hospitals, clinics, uh, and um, uh, skilled nursing facilities, things like that. Um, the second pillar is the workforce pillar. So the providers of 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 service that are out there, the proper providers of healthcare. So um, you know, physicians, nurses, uh, nurse practitioners. Uh, mental health providers, uh, dental health, et cetera. Um, and then equity. Of course, equity is a very big, big uh, focus now. Um, um, this is very important that we we included these. So um, we have some social determinants of health in there. Um, and then uh, in addition to equity, we wanted to add outcomes because as you know, social determinants, social determinants of health are, have a, you know, a big impact on, on the, the outcomes of, on um, a lot of different, different measures. Um, so we wanted to show those as well. So I wanted to stress that this is actually the just the first version of the tool. It's a version 1.0. Um, our goal for this kind of initial rollout in these, these first couple of months um, is, just, first of all, to publicize it, to let people know where it is and that they can use it. Um, and the second is to to get some uh, uh, to get some feedback so we can you know continue to, to improve upon it and and add additional functions and measures um, that people think might be helpful uh, to be able to tell the story of rural health in their communities. Um, and advocate for them at the, at the at the policy level. So uh, for data sources, um, it was very important that we wanted to use publicly available data. Uh, um, so uh, nothing in here is proprietary. Again, it's it's because it's public da data. It's it's a freely re available resource um, uh, that we're that we're hosting on our website. Um, you can link to it from from NOSAR and, and NRHA sites as well. Um, but we wanted that publicly data. We want it to be recognizable so people understand where it's coming from, um, and the sources are 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 recognizable and also accessible. So any of the data here that that I'm using uh, for this dashboard, you can go and download it yourself um, and, and get to the source data. So that was an important function for us, a feature for us. So the data sources that we use primarily uh, for infrastructure, the you know again the the places where where people seek health cares, uh, we went with HRSA. Uh, great resource uh, facilities list. They've got the uh, the address. It's uh, already geocoded. Um, uh, shows us the point where all these facilities are. So again, it's rural health clinics. Uh, we're looking at FQHCs, critical access, and uh, PPS hospitals, and 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 also SNFs. Um, that was the initial sort uh, set of uh, facilities that we're looking at here. Um, we took that that um, list of facilities and using the provider number tied it to cost report volumes. So the, the hospital cost report information system, uh, Stroudwater here, we download that every quarter. We've got years and years going back to looking at all the hospital cost reports, um, uh, you know, as we do our work here. Um, but uh, and we needed that because we needed some volumes to kind of show, you know, get some measure of, of, of activities between the rural and non-rural uh, providers. Uh, and infrastructure. So we looked at hospital beds, discharges, swing bed days, labor days, um, labor and delivery, and nursery days. 
and then clinic visits and sniff days for the for the clinics and, and sniffs. Uh, so again, using this data, it's publicly available data. Um, we're using kind of labor and delivery days and nursery days as kind of proxy for births. Uh, it's, it's kind of a little hard to get actual numbers of births uh, on a national scale. So um, that was another important thing that we had national data available. Um, and then for workforce, um, individual providers of the community, um, you know, the, your your actual uh, physicians and, and and other providers. Uh, this is coming straight from the uh, the MPI file, um, which again is a downloadable file from from CMS. So anyone, any physician or, or provider with a uh, with a uh, an MPI uh, or reports to Medicare will be in this this MPI file, and that's re updated regularly uh, as well. So, um, and then for outcomes and the equity and social determinants. Um, uh, you know, these are the medical and, and conditions that affect people's lives and health. Very important. Uh, we use primarily two sources for this. The, the CDC has this uh, 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 resource called Places. Um, it's it's relatively new, and they, but they've just expanded it to include um, uh, uh, nationwide. It's estimates of of measures and uh, um, and, and outcomes uh, for a, a whole slew of measures. Um, it's a really really good resource because it gives a uh, um, you know, small area geogra geography uh, comparisons. Um, so we use that for for a, a bulk of that, and then also Robert Wood Johnson um, County Health Rankings. I think everybody might be might be familiar with those. And that's again that's an, another great public resource. And then and then the census. So for some population data. Uh, for some of the benchmarks that we calculated in, and then uh, um, to use uh, to get uh, district uh, crosswalks. So great sources there. Okay, so we were faced a little bit with the definition of what is rural. Um, this is kind of surprising. Um, um, I should have introduced myself at the beginning, but I've been in, with Stroudwater for doing this kind of data analysis for, for over 20 years now. And um, apparently there's a lot of different definitions of rural out there. Um, depends on the state. Um, but we want to do something again that that would be kind of uh, 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 recognizable. So we stuck with HRSA. Um, in the infrastructure file, the the facilities down download has the uh, what tells you whether it's a rural or non-rural uh, facility. That was easy. Workforce. Um, these are at the zip code level. So from HRSA, um, they provided us with a, uh, a zip code level crosswalk to identify which which zip codes were were rural or non-rural. Um, then, and then for the outcomes and the equity and social determinants, um, this is county level data. Uh, so we used HRSA as rural uh, uh, methodology, uh, which bases, uh, estimates, or not estimates, but uh, figures out which census tracts within the county are, are rural and then uh, assigns a percentage to that total county. Um, so for example, I'm in Maine and Cumberland County. We've got a larger city of Portland, well, large for Maine, but um, uh, so part of that is, but mostly the county is rural. So I think we're about 30%. So um, that's how that works. And as we go in, I'm going to show a, um, a demonstration of the dashboard and you can, uh, how you can filter on different, uh, different counties uh, based on the rurality. All right. And then uh, uh, again, we assigned the data from each of those pillars to the congressional district using the census crosswalks. Um, as I'm going through here, I just want to let you know, if you have any questions, please feel free, free to uh, put it in the chat. Um, we can answer those as, as we go on. All right, so some of the initial feedback uh, that we received. So, um, you know, it's been 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 very positive. Um, on the dashboard itself, at the bottom, uh, there's an information, uh, contact information form that you can fill out. It goes directly to me. Um, and people have used that as kind of uh, a way to kind of give us suggestions and say how they're using it. So um, it's been very helpful. And I'm going to, I'll bring that up at the end too, and, and would encourage anyone that may be using this um, you know, that wants to see that, that would be a great, great way to, to, to contact me directly and, and let us know what you think. So, um, you know, we have got you know, people who are developing students, developing charts for, for le uh, legislative districts, um, um, uh, it's from the Pennsylvania office of rural health, uh, grant writing. Um, people have talked about how they're using this for grant writing. Cause it's a, uh, it's you know, kind of a reliable, reliable source. that's all right there. And, uh, you can uh, slot the uh, the information into your your grants. Uh, personally, in for Shroudwater, we've been been using this for things like uh, um, community health needs assessments that we're helping um, helping hospitals with. Uh, um, that's been a good resource, and, and also things like medical staff development plans, um, because the data is uh, you know that especially that MPI data uh, having it at that level is um, is very helpful. So. All right. So again, some examples of how um, for a state office can use this dashboard or, or a critical access hospital, um, um, different or organizations and advocacy, um, you know, understand the baseline of data. What's 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 the, the state of rural in your area? Um, you know, um, 
you know, how many, how many, what types of providers, how many, uh, how many are in rural areas? Uh, what are those outcomes? Uh, this is, we, this is important too, a central resource for displaying this information. So there's a lot of great information out there, um, especially related to rural and also related to, you know, kind of the, the, the outcomes and equity. Um, and I know that, and we've, we've got a lot of those resources that we, that we use regularly, uh, but we wanted to kind of bring something all together in one spot. So it's easy for people to get to. Um, uh, and that's what we're hoping to do here. Um, again, it's a good for developing a narrative for grants and uh, for uh, your needs section in, in a flex application, for example. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the dashboard. So again, it's hosted on our webpage, um, uh, along with uh, for an RHA and, and NOSOR. Um, and um, what I'll do is I'll kind of walk through how it all works. And then what I wanted to do is just kind of do a quick live demo. So you go to our, our webpage, it's right in the, the uh, center of the page. Um, this is what it looks like. So uh, let's run through real quick how this works. So your first tab is going to be your infrastructure tab. Um, uh, you know, start you with a statewide view. Um, we're looking at Alabama here. Um, and uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, you've got your congressional district map. Um, uh, and that is going to be your, your your way to filter your 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 view. Um, this is a Tableau dashboard. So if anybody is familiar with Tableau, you'll be, you'll be familiar with the, the different functionality with it. So um, congressional district map up on the, up the upper left hand. Uh, on the bottom uh, left, uh, that is showing the actual facilities, uh, the point locations for those facilities. Um, the brown is going to be your rural facilities, and the blue is going to be the non-rural facilities based, again, on that HRSA, um, that HRSA file. Um, and then we talked about that those volumes. So in the, uh, the, to the right of that uh, map, um, we've got the table that shows the categories of so the hospitals and the uh, broken out by critical access and uh, uh, PPS, um, and then the clinics and skilled nursing facilities, and then the volume types. So again, beds, your discharges, uh, labor and delivery days, et cetera, um, by hospital type, um, and then looking at visits uh, for FQHCs, freestanding and provider-based. Um, this is coming, again, from the cost report. Um, and then uh, days for uh, skilled uh, SNFs, uh, both freestanding and provider-based. And then a breakout of whether it's uh, uh, those are rural or non-rural. Uh, and then in the chart will show you that, you know, for example, in Alabama, um, uh, looking at all these volumes, you've got 44% of them are happening in a rural rural facility. Um, and then it breaks it out. Um, you know, swing bed days are going to be mostly in, in rural. Um, uh, your IHCs are going to be mostly in rural, obviously. Um, so it gives you a good 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 breakout there. All right, um, let's move on to selecting a district. So you select your second congressional district in Alabama. All the maps and the charts will filter. Um, oh, I did want to point out, just if you look over to the right here, um, there's a state drop down. So that's how you'd find your state. And that would, uh, you know, for each each of the tab, will uh, uh, will will load your particular state. So so again, um, as you pick your your um, your filter, um, everything everything will filter on the screen. Um, and just show the the information for that congressional district. All right, so the workforce tab is laid out uh, very similarly to the to the infrastructure tab. Um, in this case, uh, we're again looking at the second congressional district of Alabama. Um, and then we started with uh, workforce categories uh, from the MPI files is kind of based on the the meetings that we had with NRHA and NOSOR, uh, one of the things that we wanted to focus on. So we, these are the key provider types that we looked at. So uh, behavioral health, which is going to include, you know, therapists, uh, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, things like that uh, within and uh, within behavior, behavioral health. Um, oral health is including uh, inclusive of dentists, uh, dental hygienists, um, oral surgeons, things like that. So, and I can be happy to share that those groupings with anybody who's uh, who's, who's interested. Um, family medicine, general practice, internal med, uh, nurse practitioners were uh, was was, was important. Um, OBGYNs, um, and then some uh, you know peds and, and physician assistants. Um, so again, this is all coming from the MPI file. This is going to be based on the provider and where their office is located, um, based on that that zip code um, crosswalk. Uh, so you know, so as we can see in the second district in Alabama, uh, uh, seventy four percent of those providers are in a in a non rural area. 
um, and then it breaks it out. And then on the bottom, you know, so the 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 table will show you kind of the the actual numbers and then the percentage. And then I wanted to show the uh, uh, on the chart below um, just the 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 kind of the count of the providers that we're looking at. So um, as you can see in this district, uh, nurse practitioners are the, are the the highest number of those providers. All right, the next tab is uh, your outcomes. So this is uh, a little bit different, but uh, um, similar with the uh, um, uh, congressional district map up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and what we've done here is we've looked at different, uh, the measures uh, that we decided for this initial go around um, include tooth loss. Um, so we wanted to kind of cover things, you know, overall general care, kind of chronic conditions, mental health and dental health. Um, and then, and then, and then, uh, uh, infants. So, so kind of a nice, uh, uh, capture of, you know, overall, uh, highlights of, 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 of outcomes. Um, so tooth loss, uh, you know, as a, as a measure of dental health, um, cancer, heart disease, um, some high blood pressure, things like that. Um, and we're looking at diabetes here, um, um, infant mortality, life expectancy is an interesting one that comes from Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, and then some some uh, mental health, uh, uh, you know, as far as you know, suicides and, and depression. So um, in this case, we're looking at diabetes. You start with kind of an overall view of the state. And again, this is um, on the bottom, you'll get your source. So this is coming from that, uh, that places data from the CDC. Uh, again, just a really great data source. Um, uh, and what we've done, the only thing we've added here is that we've uh, we've we've created a state benchmark based on the same calculations that CDC is using in those county levels. So they give us the number of population, and then we uh, uh, kind of kind of created a benchmark for the state. So what this is showing me that in Alabama, uh, among adults eighteen years of over and and and, and older, um, there's a twelve point twelve percent prevalence of of diagnosed diabetes. Um, statewide. And then the map is going to show kind of the variance from that state. Uh, so obviously orange is going to be higher and blue will be lower. So you can immediately see that, you know, in Alabama, you've got some, uh, some pockets of areas that are, that are, that are, you know, of a higher prevalence than others. Um, this is pretty interesting as you walk through the different ones. Um, uh, yep. So then uh, the drop down the measures is upper the upper right hand corner, and we'll get into that in a bit for the live demo. Okay, and then equity, and then social determinants of health. The measures we use for this, um, aging population, uh, so anyone, uh, populations, percentage of population that's over 65 uh, in the county. Education, uh, is bachelor's degree, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, high school um, uh, attainment um, population. This is, this is coming from the census um, and, and CDC as well. Um, minority status, so what uh, the CDC did was looked at the census data, um, grouped the uh, uh, racial and ethnic categories um, all together and and uh, calculated what percentage of that was of the total population. So, um, and then poverty, um, single parent households, and then unemployment are available here. So again, uh, the benchmark for uh, people in poverty uh, in Alabama, 25.3% of all people in, in Alabama um, at that poverty level of 100% or below. Um, and then you can see uh, by county, um, what are the, uh, the the variances there within the state? Okay, and then um, the nice thing about Tableau, if you've ever used it before, is that you're able to take what you're looking at and create a nice image um, and download that image. Um, this is what people are using to slot into, you know, flex applications or um, or just uh, you know equity equity reports, things like that. Um, and I'll show you how we can do that um, with a live demo. Um, and then again, that uh, we talked about how that what is rural uh, counties, you know, how to highlight your your county. So uh, in the case what we did here, we used that HRSA definition for rural counties. And we um, uh, so a county that is 100 um, percent all census blocks. Um, are rural. That's going to be 100% rural. Mostly rural is anything over over 50% and below 100%. Mostly urban is uh, between zero and 50% um, um, uh, urban, and then urban is going to be 100% urban. So with that, I like to get um, once again. Um, we're looking for feedback here, so I would appreciate as we're going through this. Um, you know, our goal is to improve this, make this a publicly available uh, continuous resource. Um, that folks can use uh, to tell the story of rural health. 
Um, if you have any recommendations, I, again, I encourage you to kind of, uh, uh, to, you know, to reach out to us, use that form, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and specifically, we're looking for, you know, is this accessible? Does it make sense? Um, what's your experience? Um, uh, is the information useful? Um, is it timely enough? And uh, what metrics uh, should we add, if any? So I'm going to escape out of this and go into a... Go to the web page here. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to post in the chat right now uh, for everyone the uh, the website, so you can follow along if you want to. Okay, so um, here's where we are. It's on Stroudwater. Again, if you haven't registered for your uh, virtual conferences, it's right on top there. Um, so. Uh, it's going to give you the information that you have here if you have any more questions. So here's what the the the, the tool is showing. Uh, this will break out and show what kind of the the, the different uh, different measures that we have in there. Um, on the bottom here, we've got our data sources that are that are being used um, and um, links to the person methodology that I talked about. Um, some information about NRHA and NOSOR and then of course Stroudwater. And this is that feedback form that I wanted to talk about. So. Um, uh, again, this reach this is comes directly to me. Um, really love to hear uh, your your feedback about what we have here. So let's do a quick demo. Um, I'm going to scroll down here. Oops, let me reload here. You can go full screen. Um, and we already did Alabama, so let's look at Georgia. Okay, so we start with uh, with an overview of Georgia for infrastructure. Um, all right. Um, so the nice thing about Tableau here, uh, as you uh, mouse over the different um, uh, the different charts, you'll get some more information. Uh, this is uh, particularly interesting when you go over the map because um, it'll actually show you what those what those names are. Uh, what those sites are, what uh, type of provider, what category, et cetera, and where they're located. Um, so, uh, you know, as we see in Georgia, 56.6% uh, per are in um, uh, non-rural locations. Um, if we wanted to look at uh, a congressional district here, I'm going to click on number nine, um, and everything will, uh, will filter. Uh, so nine is a little bit more rural. So we have 65% of all total um, infrastructures in, are in rural locations. Um, one thing I, I did want to point out, if you don't know your congressional district, as long as you know the number, there's a little look up here. So you can highlight the district as you roll down, uh, especially for some of these smaller ones around Atlanta. It makes it a little bit easier to find on the map. Um, and as I said before, the nice thing about Tableau is you can use some of these to if you want to take some of this information and drop it into a, a report um, or a grant, uh, you know, a, a grant report application, uh, you can highlight these. Um, it'll give you some some specific information. And then if we bounce out of here for a minute, uh, you can download these right here, either as a nice uh, PNG file or a PDF or a PowerPoint slide. So nice function about with uh, with Tableau. All right, let's uh, skip over to the workforce. And we're looking at Georgia. I'm going to go back to full screen. Um, interesting thing I thought about with Georgia was that when you've got your uh, your infrastructure is about 40 some percent um, um, rural. Let's look at yeah, 43 percent rural, um, and the workforce is. Uh, Only about 10%, 9.8%. 9, 9 so that, that was interesting. Um, again, as you uh, yeah, select the different congressional districts, you could do actually do multiple districts as well if you wanted to um, and show how those show how those change. So um, just focus on one here. Um, you know, this is the breakout of these different these different uh, uh, these different types, and then the the total count of that workforce, uh, rural versus non rural. All right, let's switch over to health uh, outcomes.
So the different measures are available on the upper right hand corner here. Um, you can drop down. I'm going to look at, so for example, let's look at heart disease for Georgia. So an overall 4.5, uh, 5.4% 5 .5 prevalence of, of heart disease uh, among those adults, uh, you know, you know um, 18 years of age or older. Um, and then which, uh, you know, which counties are, are variances from those, from those things, from those, uh, that measure. And as I said, the, uh, your, um, source will change in the bottom here. So in this case, the life expectancy is from, from Robert Wood Johnson. Um, again, an excellent resource. Um, let's see, let's look at high blood pressure, for example. Yeah, so clearly you can see the different differences in, within the state uh, uh, for those outcomes. Um, and let's click on a uh, congressional district. And as you click on the district, you'll get the same. It'll it'll uh, you know filter and but show the same variance. Um, so you can see those kind of hotspots uh, within the district um, itself. All right. And lastly, I'm going to jump over to the uh, equity. Again, looking at Georgia, this is the aging population within Georgia. So 14.4% of persons uh, 65 and older um, within Georgia. Um, uh, on the lower uh, table here, you've got the measure value and the variance from state. Um, you can also mouse over these, these counties. We didn't label the counties just because it would be a little bit too busy, but you can mouse over and get the county name, um, what that population is. Um, uh, for that, and then the, the the actual measures and the variances uh, within there. Um, and I wanted to highlight this. Uh, so this uh, that rural and urban counties. So if we wanted to say, okay, well, just show me the rural, 100% rural counties in in Georgia. Click on that. It's going to highlight those, um, just those counties, and you can get that um, that view as well. And again, the different measures here. Uh, let's look at um, uh, poverty. And let's filter by a congressional district up here. So there you go. So again, um, I encourage everyone to, uh, you know, please, please uh, uh, familiarize yourself with this. Let us know what you think. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions. We're a little bit early, but uh, does anyone have any uh, any questions about the data? Two questions we've gotten earlier um, uh, from earlier presentations are um, what, how often will it be updated? Um, so each of the different sources uh, has different times when they're updated. Um, but I think what we'll, we'll, we're planning on doing is having it uh, be updated earlier in, at the beginning of each year um, so that we can roll it out each time at the, uh, hopefully at the policy conference in, in DC in the early, early part of February. Um, that way we'll have you know, fresh data to take uh, to to the Capitol Hill. Um, and um, that would be that's that that would be our goal. So um, the other question we had is what types of um, uh, measures are you adding? So some of the feedback we've initially got from people, um, we've asked for uh, nursing, uh, which we don't have in the providers section in the workforce section. So that's going to be uh, looking at from nurses, LPNs, uh, uh, RNs, um, nurses, aides, uh, uh, basically anyone within a kind of, kind of the, the nursing, uh, uh, provider profession there. Um, so we're adding that that's going to come out in, um, the end of June. So we're going to do a, do a quick update. Um, um, and then the other, uh, measure that was interesting, to, uh, um, of interest for NRHA in particular, uh, specific to telehealth was, uh, broadband access. So, the CDC has um, uh, an estimate of households with uh, without broadband um, by that county level. So that will be in the uh, equity and the social determinants of health tab, um, you know, showing where um, there are some some deserts for broadband access. Again, that was uh, very important for uh, looking at telehealth um, opportunities and where there might be challenges for that. So. Hey, Keith, it's Hillary. Yes. Um, hey, Hillary. Not <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but if 
if there were people um, on the on the webinar who are located in a specific area and would like to see um, data from you know their geographic area, would that mm -hmm. be an option if people wanted to put their location into the chat or you know certain um, data that you're curious about? And Keith would magically make that appear. Sure, I can I can do that if you want. Um, um... We, Any um, other questions about the? Uh... Oh, thank you, Mary. I I, I appreciate that. Uh, I think we, we also had had some a question about whether this um could be. Oh, you do have another question, Keith. Um, Amy is wondering if there's a place on the site that tells the time frame the data was taken from. Yes. Uh, in the outcomes you'll see that it's uh on the bottom there it'll it's the county data 2023 release so um that is the the um for for the cdc um if we were to switch over to um let's look at a robert wood johnson one come on um Going to drop over the outcomes here. So life expectancy is going to be okay. This is infant mortality. Um, 2023 release for for Robert Wood Johnson. So their data is based um, on. It's going to be a little bit older data, just because that's how it works. So um, again, but that using that publicly available data, that's what we wanted to make sure that we've got you know the most the most recent one that's you know as we when we release this in February. So um, for the other two, uh, so workforce, uh, the MPI file is updated. I believe it's quarterly, um, if not monthly sometimes, but this one is from um, um, earlier this year. So January, uh, February was the when we updated it. Um, yeah, you know, it's when we do our sixth, uh, the, the when we add the uh, nurses and the um, um, uh, the other uh, piece that I talked about, the broadband, um, the broadband will be the same source. We might update the workforce just because there's newer data available and we're refreshing all the data. Um, so we haven't decided whether we would do that kind of more of like on a, a shorter schedule rather than a year, um, uh, the workforce, just because it is updated, the MPI file. Um, but that should be should be you know relatively current to this year. Uh, and then infrastructure is going to be based on what um, uh, what HRSA's file is. So uh, it's the HRSA Data Explorer. Um, uh, it's a bit available on their site, and um, I believe that's updated every six months, I believe. So thanks, Keith. I think yep. someone had also asked previously about whether um, this data could be something that they use in um, in grant writing. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I, I do want to um, again, you can use it right off the tool here. It's 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 free. Um, uh, you'll get, uh, you know, those downloads. Uh, well, will just be a nice what basically what you see on the screen is what you'll download um, and it'll show the source kind of on the on the bottom and then, uh, you know, it'll tell where it came from that it's from Stroud Waters analysis here as well. Um, so, yeah, you can. Um, again, it's publicly available data. Um, it's right there. Um, if you wanted to, um, you know, if there was some more specific data, like I said, we've used this internally for clients for. Um, uh, we just recently did a study, a Texas uh, uh, study on on obstetrics, OB OBGYN shortages. Um, so we actually use this as in turn in in almost with a like a medical staff um, ratios. So taking the NMPI data and showing where there are shortages of of of, of OBs uh, based on uh, you know ratios, population ratios. Um, so that was very helpful. So you can use it that way. Although you'd have to con reach out to Stroudwater and and we'd be you know, be, but we'd be happy to work with you to to get some more specific data because I do have it. You know, all the data is at a very granular level. Um, one of the things we're we're, we're doing um, internally too is that you know that for the outcomes and the um, equity piece, uh, the um, county level was made more sense for us to show 
those. But the data is available at a zip code level. Zikta is what CDC has it. So um, we are working on a, a database um, that we're going to use for some of our work that has the zip code level data, uh, again, benchmarked. Uh, and we've already used that in, in things of like, like I said, with the medical staff development plan, just to show kind of what the outcomes are um, within those specific service areas and zip code service areas. Um, and also we've used it for uh, community health needs assessment as you know, part of uh, tying that into a strategy for a hospital to to address those concerns that are going on, those those outcomes and those equity concerns that are within their service area. So please feel free to reach out to us um, uh, for that kind of information. We'd be happy to work with anyone um, to get kind of a, a custom uh, custom report. We did have uh, after our initial release in February, uh, somebody reached out and said, well, can I look at a region, something regional? Um, so I was able to, you know, kind of make a custom dashboard that looked at Three or four states uh, in the upper Midwest, all all at once, um, uh, uh, and we, you know, I'm happy to do that if if somebody has that that need. So, again, you can you can reach out to Stroudwater directly from our website here. Again, that, that info um, that that um, form on the bottom of the page will go directly to me. I promise we won't spam you or anything like that. There's no charge, but um, uh, we'd really like to know what uh, uh, what you might need. Thank you, uh, Amy, for your question. Awesome. Thank you so much, Keith. Sure. Um, anyone else have any other questions? We... I think if we're all set with questions, then we can yeah. give folks some time back. Sure. I just want to say before you go, um, thank you for, for joining us. Um, and also we are, um, uh, when you exit here, uh, Hillary, maybe you want to say that we'll, there'll be a survey, uh, for this conference and we'd love to know what your feedback is for the conference overall. And we hope that everybody, uh, enjoyed the presentations and, um, has a good, good weekend. Yep. Hillary. We're, we're always trying to improve, uh, this, this conference and make sure that we're tailoring it to what all of you need. So, um, the survey that pops up, will take. Uh, very short time and we truly value and appreciate your time and your feedback. Thank you so much, Keith. Thank you, Lindsay and Paula. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today. All right. Take care.